What number is he? That one. Need a microphone to pray. Let us, yeah. <laughs> Lord, we thank you for this day, this opportunity you've given us to serve you and to serve our communities and our state. Pray, Lord, that you'd give us wisdom and guidance as we go through this process. Pray for your blessings on all that we do today. In Jesus' name I ask, amen. Thank you, Representative Coomer, and welcome everyone to our first uh, meeting of Banks and Banking Committee for this year. Um, we do have uh, three new members, one of them which is present. Representative Trey Rhodes, for those of you out there who hadn't met Representative Rhodes, uh, he's been here, what, 19 legislative days now? <laughs> Nine? Yeah, that's right. You got here a little late. That's right. Yeah. Does he have full voting rights with that little bit of experience? All right. Okay. May need to make an addendum to the rules down here, but... But we're happy to have you, Representative uh, Rhodes. Congratulations, and, and happy to have you. Also, uh, Chairman Mike Jacobs, I don't believe he's with us, and uh, Representative John Deffenball, who had to go to transportation where they needed a quorum of some type. Uh, <laughs> I don't know what's going on. Uh, scary. Uh, Susie Womack, to my left, is our committee aide. Uh, Robert House is our intern, but I don't believe Robert's in here right now, but stop by and Stop by and oh, there he is back there in the back. Okay, yeah, okay, that's Robert back there. Uh, we uh, Judge Caldwell's not with us, is he? No, we don't have to sing happy birthday, do we? Yeah, it's his birthday today. Um, well, we do have a little bit of housekeeping before we get to our business. Inside your folder are the committee rules. As a salesman, I used to have used to say, I think they're pretty self exclamatory. Uh, but uh, has everyone had a chance to read them? Uh, just look at them. There, uh, I don't believe there's any changes since last year. If there's no uh, comment or no uh, additions needed for the rules, I would entertain a motion that we adopt them. Move we adopt the rules as presented. Second. I have a motion and a second. Uh, all in favor, say aye. Any opposed? All right. The rules are adopted. Inside uh, your folder is House Bill 184. Representative Bruce Williamson is here to uh, to present that bill. Uh, I'll let him introduce Mr. Fears and tell him, you know, what he's doing here and offer an assistance in explaining the bill, I assume. <laughs> What he's uh, got it? I think so. Six six E R. This is the Department of Banking and Fi Finance annual cleanup bill. Uh, it contains revisions to the code identified internally by the department and suggested by industry over the previous five years. It touches on just about every entity regulated by the department. This is going to be banks, credit unions, holding companies, money service businesses, and you might remember the bill we did last year as a committee that sort of cleaned up a lot to do with the money service businesses, but we just have a minor one going on this change. Um, also, mortgage licensees, uh, it's going to help them out a little bit in that industry and merchant acquire limited purpose banks uh, as well as the department's general powers. The legislation is supported by both the Georgia Bankers Association, the Community Bankers Association, and the Georgia Credit Union Affiliates as well as, as, well as the Mortgage uh, Bankers Association, I might add. Uh, the bill seems lengthy, uh, but you'll see that the changes are fairly easy to understand. <laughs> because I didn't want to use that other word that you told me not to use. Uh, like removing requirements to submit copies of applications. I think you'll be interested. Some of the bankers might be sad to note that they can no longer telegraph uh, anybody or use telegrams to uh, communicate with their uh, shareholders. Uh, but it is cleaning up some, some archaic language you'll find throughout the bill. Uh, the provision uh, affecting credit unions and banks is intended to update the tools the department has to ensure that our state chartered institutions are allowed to operate on a, on a competitive footing 
as are the nationally charted institutions. And on that note, you're going to notice there's a lot of uh, language about parity powers. Uh, and what you're talking about there is, is, is allowing our state chartered institutions to be competitive immediately with the national chartered institutions. Um, the proposed revision provides that the department can grant parity to our state chartered institutions and credit unions if a federal bank or credit union can legally engage in an activity that may otherwise be precluded by our current banking code. And uh, I like, we're, we're phrasing it quite um, easily understood. Parity is a fundamental question of fairness. Uh, if the federal government permits a federally chartered credit union or bank that is operating in Georgia to engage in an activity, then uh, why should a state chartered credit union or bank be prevented from engaging in that exact same activity? Uh, to give an example, a more simple example of a Bank of America branch in um, Name Your Town, think of your own hometown, can engage in a banking activity, why can't your uh, state chartered credit union or community bank right across the street enjoy those same privileges? Uh, so without parity, state chartered credit unions and banks will be at a competitive disadvantage. Uh, another item in the bill uh, proposes to give the department power to place, and this is particularly important, place a credit union in conservatorship in an effort to, buy, to avoid failure. You know, we've been through this Chernobyl, of, we've been called the Chernobyl of banking uh, over the last six or seven years, and most of our financial institutions are, are coming back, but they're save a credit union and their depositors if rather than putting them out of business First, and that right now, the, as I understand, the the, uh, the code, the, the, the department's hands is pretty much tied. You got to shut them down, rather than stepping in and and trying to uh, con conserve the entity. You know, recapitalize it, uh, get it up and operating again, and then uh, get it back in the hands of the, the members with a new leadership in place. Um, so that's, that's an important uh, flexibility that this bill provo proposes to give to the Department of Banking and Finance. Um, and then, really, with the only other option being liquidating the credit union, which is the, you know, the uh, option of last resort, and then you've got issues with uh, your de uh, deposit insurance, uh, credit union, uh, Deposit Insurance Organization, I forget the name of it, it's analogous to the federal FDIC that the state and national banks uh, uh, have their insurance with, but it provi prevents a, otherwise what would be a loss to that insuring organization. Uh, so in, in a nutshell, this bill proposes some much needed cleanup of the banking laws in the state. And I failed to introduce Bo Fears, who is the general counsel for the Department of Banking and Finance. Uh, he is. Uh, very knowledgeable about all matters, uh, in the different code sections. So uh, he and I both will attempt to answer any questions that the committee might have. Thank you, Representative Williamson. Uh, are there any questions for the author, Mr. Fears? I'm sorry, Representative Kelly. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, Representative Williams, I just have one question. Maybe this is better directed at Bo. Um, I, I'm just looking at Section 6, starting at kind of line 203. We're talking about um, emergency situations and the governor's ability to close a, a financial institution there. I just need a little more clarification on one, why we're eliminating a financial emergency and, and making it broader now to include just an emergency. And I had some concern with, with that. Well, if you back up the line 201, it still includes economic crises. And Representative Kelly, if, if, if I may, um, part of this is, is that a banks are required to be open on a certain number of days. And so, so last year with the, all the snowstorms, when the governor declared simply that state of emergency, mm -hmm. Days and be in compliance with those. So, 
but I think the idea is it would be any sort of emergency that the, the governor declares, be it a financial emergency or a state of emergency. And my guess when, is when this legislation was originally enacted, you know, post Great Depression, and everyone was envisioning financial emergencies. And so, so the process here would be a bank would come to the the department and say you know we have this emergency we're not gonna be able to open and it's almost more like a waiver not a we're keeping you closed for a sure. spare time uh, absolutely and, and so okay. the first part deals just with the governor and so if i declare a state of emergency for you know half of georgia all these banks have the ability but then let's say an individual institution there happens to be a fire at the bank they call up the department and say we've had a fire you know just just want to let you know we're not going to be open today and the commissioner will then say obviously in that circumstance you don't have to be open and, and you'll be able to and it'll be a waiver it's not going to be a permanent closure like you think all these banks that have been closing. It's not that. It's just for a couple of days. Okay. It makes it a lot clearer for me to, to see it as a waiver instead of the way it was written made it look a little bit like he would say you're closed. Right. And that is not at all what is intended. Okay. So, and, and, and to put it in perspective, the reason it's always been about giving <coughs> depositors access to their money that's the why the laws are in place that they have to bank financial institutions have to be open but obviously um, now with the advent of the internet there's so much financial transactions going on between uh, automated telephone banking and, and uh, internet banking uh, customers virtually have 24 7 access to the to their deposited funds right now so it gives a little bit more flexibility already to the consumers out there uh, that is not is uh, quite is is urgent that uh, you don't have to physically be there physically to get your be money. there uh, and because it becomes a, a, a safety issue uh, in certain you know certain circumstances getting employees to and from the uh, the, the financial institution when it, when it is a foot of snow out there or icy street so Gives them gives everybody some flexibility to um, to do the right thing when when the time comes. All right, thank you. I just want a little more clarification. Thanks. Thank you. Is that Representative Murphy? I mean, no. uh, oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Go ahead and ask a question. Okay. I'm sorry. That's quite all right. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Yeah. Chairman. Yeah, sure. uh, thank you for the presentation. I just have one question. Uh, there's been uh, several references made to our credit unions. Uh, will this symmetrically ensure that credit unions are have the same protections as the banks with respect to the uh, question that my contemporary just asked. Uh, as you know, credit unions are typically open on Saturdays as well. Uh, yes, sir. This uh, this gives you know, the department supervises both credit unions. It's both state chartered credit unions and state chartered uh, banks. So this uh, flexibility would apply to both classes of institutions. Thank you. Is that all, Representative Smith? That was it. Okay. Who's got number 10 pressed? I can't tell. Representative Duncan, is that you? No, I, I can't tell who it is. <laughs> Quick question here. Um, okay. Can you give me a working example of an economic crisis just to help me figure out what that looks like? Um, well, I think this was written in really the Great Depression. Um, so the, the idea that if, if there are runs on the bank, so here it is, we're going to shut the bank down for a temporary period of time so there's not a run. So there's not the lines out the door, there's not on the, they're not on the news. And then and, and when you can either, if the bank has the ability to pay the deposits out, then you can let them go over, or if it needs to be closed, and officially closed in an orderly manner, it can be closed. I understand. Um, one, one quick follow-up to that. So how does that information get relayed to the governor? So he's got to be the one to make that decision. Right. How does, t t walk me through how that, that private bank communicates out to the governor that, hey, there's a run on the bank? Uh, I think what, how that would happen is that would probably come through the department. We would know because we're monitoring the banks. We know when there are liquidity issues and liquidity concerns, and we would relay that information to the governor's office. And so if the governor, if the governor needed to declare that, but I think when the governor declares it, it would be more systemic. Mm -hmm. um, wouldn't be just institutional. It wouldn't just be Okay. Thank you. Good question. So Representative Flood, you have a question? Uh, at the proper time, I'd like to make a motion. Okay, I think we've got one more. We have a question down there, or did I not turn off? No, I do. Okay. 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 
Are there any more questions before we uh, entertain motion? I was kind of hoping I'd uh, somebody making a, a, a friendly amendment to start taxing credit unions like we do banks, but absent that, oh, yeah. uh, a, 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 well, absent that, that uh, motion. Yeah, that'll, yeah, there you go. There, now the light's on. It, it's lit up. Thank you for that, Representative Williamson. Huh? Yeah. Uh, do you, is there really a question down here, or is there a comp? Oh, yeah. <laughs> do you want to pour fuel on the fire, or do you want to? Uh, I recognize you for a comment or a question if you have one. No. Okay. She's going to. He understands. I, I, I think we all do, and we all very much appreciate that. Okay. All right. We have uh, a motion. I'll entertain that motion, Representative Flood. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I move do pass House Bill 184. Have a motion do pass. Is there a second? We have a second. Is there any further discussion on the motion? Okay. All those in favor of due pass, vote aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. Okay. Do Thank pass you, recommendation. Chairman. Thank you. Chairman. Thank you both. Are you ready, sir? All right. Take your spot. Okay, uh, Representative Donahue is going to give us an explanation of uh, House Bill 299. Uh, we are going to entertain questions once he gets through uh, explaining the bill. We will not vote on the bill today. This is just uh, hearing only. Are you ready, sir? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Right, we'll proceed. Thank you. Members of our committee, Banks and Banking, love this committee and appreciate the opportunity to share it with you. I bring before you House Bill 299. LC number 390898. What this is basically is called a convenience fee. To tell you a little bit about where we're going with this, I own rental cabins. And if you stay in a cabin of mine, you can pay me $1,000 cash. That's interest. I mean, not interest, that's tax and everything. You can write me a check or you can pay me cash. You have the choice to make a decision if you use a credit card or a debit card. I'm going to charge you $37.50, whatever that card, the cost factor is. So I allow you to make that decision when you rent my cabins. I've been doing this for five years, and probably 80% of the people will tell me they have no problem with it, the credit card, because they use it for mileage points, et cetera. Now, what happens is we've been doing this in the state, and we have code that pretty much says we can do it. The banks are not against this. But we have certain classifications that basically they have contracts that are defined a little bit more on what they can do and can't do. And, and one of them that we have, an institutional uh, lending company, that it says they can charge no other fees. And what we're trying to do basically here is recoup the fee to where you have the convenience of making a decision if you want to pay on a loan a price with the deduction of a debit card that they can come back and recoup that cost or a credit card or electronic payment card. So you still make the decision. What happens is it helps them to, to look at bringing back the cost factor when they sit down with you and they make a loan. A lot of these loans that we're talking about, uh, pretty much we're talking about somewhere $600, $700. You might pay $60 a month, might pay $80 a month. And now what's happening, people are coming in and paying more with a debit card. So this opens it up for other people that are held by guidelines of the federal government that are a little bit stricter. We are just trying to do that. That's the only thing is this convenience fee that we're trying to do is just make it to where they can recoup a cost because of decisions we make. Okay, that's okay. All right. Well, we've got a couple of questions. Oh, okay. Go ahead, you first. 
Oh, uh, I did that. I get the wrong mic. Okay. Go. Thank you, Mr. Yeah. Chairman. Uh, um, when would they recruit these costs? What I'm, I'm trying to figure out a when these. Payment, what a phone payment. What would happen is if you come in and use a debit card, and, and the card some can change. They're usually about a three percent. We use a company called VRBO on our cabins. They have yeah. an established I'm, rate. I'm familiar. We have other credit cards that if you pay Square D or whatever, there's a certain percentage. Upon that, I'll let you know up front what the cost will be. I cannot charge you any more than that cost factor. So if you're going to pay me $1,000, that's the cost of goods for staying in a cabin yeah. with taxes. If you want to, for convenience, use a credit card, debit card, now it incurs a cost upon me. So I pass it along. I've been doing it for yep. five years in the state. We can do this already. There are certain guidelines that certain groups will fall under a certain umbrella. Just happens one that I'm talking about is, for instance, you could look, use financial loan corporations, uh, Gila. You could use several ones that it falls under where it states that you can have no other charges. And you've, you've sat down and agreed on a payment of $60 a month or $80 a month for six months or eight months. So what happens, we're just giving them the opportunity to recoup that cost if you make a decision to use a debit card or a credit card. Okay. Is that it, Representative Dickey? Okay. Did you have, a, did you have something, Representative Kelly? Okay. All right. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman and uh, Representative Donahue. This, you know, in my opinion, could really weigh into the success or failure of your bill. But you keep walking through a through a example where you charge a thousand dollars to rent one of your cabins. Right. But I would be sure that you would give members of this committee a little discount on that. Is that correct? For you, sir, it's nine sixteen. Plus <laughs> That's exactly right. Depending on how you pay for that. All right. Representative Duncan, uh, he answered the question. Okay, preacher, you want a discount too, or you? <laughs> no, I'm good. Representative Coomer, okay. Yeah, thank you. Um, uh, you mentioned in your comments that there were other groups or other entities that are uh, currently prohibited from collecting this fee in Georgia. Can you kind of? I'm not picking on you, but no, can no. you identify those other groups of? Uh, you know, there would be several uh, lenders that would fall under this. Um, you could have pretty much right now, just to show you some. Do insurance companies have this in code, uh, where they have this to prove that they used to have this problem, but now by code they can charge motor vehicles. Um, there's several sales and finance, and now they put that in there because people started buying. And making payments with credit card and debit cards. So, so is it was a is it generally legal? But then we prohibited it in some areas, and yes, now this legal, is an area that's prohibited. We're taking it back of off. The areas. Yes, sir. Okay. There's just a few by guidelines. They are not allowed because of the wording of contracts that states there will be no other charges. So it's by the contract. It's not by code that it's prohibited. It would be it would be codes, but in insurance or motor vehicle, you'd have different contracts drawn up for whatever. If you're selling an automobile or if you're writing an insurance policy. Okay, but for these affected folks, is it is it unlawful for them to collect it at this point, or is it just a violation of a standard contract? It's a violation provision? of a standard contract. So, so. I guess I'm a little confused. Why are we changing the law if we're trying to change how standard contracts are written? We're, we're opening up to where certain guidelines is uh, pretty much where they are going to let you know that there is a charge for you making a decision, but it's not withholding them. From, or I guess it would be best to say it's not disallowing them to charge you. Now they can't come back and charge you. So it states no other charges. We're just trying to change that to where in certain groups, this one would have to be one for a reference would be like uh, Gila, Georgia Industrial Loans Association. On their contract, it says that. There's other contracts that would fall under there by law, by federal government that is imposed on them that's not imposed by other entities. So is that a standard contract provision that's required by the law? 
and we're and we're changing it so that they don't have to have that in in their contract anymore it's, i'm just trying to figure out what we're getting at here we're, we're basically trying to do right now you can pretty much do this in the state of georgia okay but there's certain groups that are held to different accountabilities for maybe the association of people that they lease money to or, or, or loan money to and because of that they have different uh, rules and regulations they have to go under what we're doing is basically correcting one to where we can allow them to up front let whoever he or she that the borrower understand that if they pay it's up to them a convenience fee there will be a charge to recoup the cost that would you know pretty much be implied to them okay yeah. representative Harden yeah. yeah thank you uh representative Donna, who just one one thing that uh just I'm, I'm trying to to understand a convenience fee authorized under this code section shall not constitute interest an additional charge a time price differential a finance charge or a service charge with the meaning within the meaning of code section what uh are, and i assume all of those terms are defined in that code section yes sir. all right so and and this convenience fee does not fall under any of the definitions of those terms is that it does in their in their basic contract it states that we can charge up to let me let me find that one i think it's up to five percent and then you would have to come back and pretty much have it passed again in code if, if, if for whatever reason let's say american express said it's a 5.2 percent charge uh, not to say they do just yeah. to use them for an example if you're looking at a visa mastercard they have different fees in american express so what you're doing is the code already says you can go up to five percent it's just with certain groups and i use the term again with uh, gila they have a contract that eliminates pretty much or keeps them from trying to recoup that cost we're just trying to take it for people that fall in that group the opportunity because you make a choice that you can basically recoup that cost or you can pay cash and not have to worry about it or write a check All right would it would it be good to just put a definition of convenience fee in the in the bill to so that and 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 i know you say it is uh people you choosing to to, to do an option of payment by electronic means so that is a definition of a convenience fee yes sir and let me see if there's anything in here For instance, code 7418, this is one I'd said earlier. Any rate of interest greater than 5% per month, either directly or indirectly, by ways of commission for advances, discounts, or exchange, or the purchase of salary or wages. This goes on basically to let you know that, that is, that's the code that we can go up to 5% if that's the charge. What you're asking pretty much is the definition would be, um, and I don't have that here, um, convenience would be pretty much a fee that you make a decision the way i would understand the definition and i apologize for not having that completely in the well what i mean would the definition just be a fee charge uh for utilization of uh, the option of electronic payments pretty much it wouldn't you can only charge what that fee would be depending on the card or the device yeah. if it was okay. electronic funds if it was uh, like i said american express visa whatever mm -hmm. or debit card whatever the price is that's what you can charge no more Okay. Representative Strickland. No, oh, I'm sorry, I hit the wrong button. I guess you, I tell you Trey's already said no. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's your turn. Representative Donahue, I still am a little bit confused on this too. Right now, if a lender or merchant want to collect a convenient fee, can they put that in their contract in the loan they made to somebody? Can they allow for that convenient fee convenience fee in the contract itself or is that prohibited by Georgia law right now? Right now in the contract, it affects a small group of people. And a small group of people here in the state, 
and you know, when, and y'all correct me, any of the gentlemen back here that are in the banking or the, the credit unions, I do not want to misrepresent this, mm -hmm. but with not having a problem with this, basically, how would, in the banking system, how would you run it if I come in and decided to make all my payments with a credit card? We're not merchants. The banks are not merchants. So right. There's no merchant fee. What you're talking about is a merchant fee. Right. And you're just trying to recoup the merchant fee. Yes, sir. But that, that's my my question really is can this be privately contracted for or do we need state law allowing it is, is will this actually allow it in existing contracts this will change it to where they are legal within their contract within the contracts they currently have why could they not go and do a new contract moving forward that provides for this convenient fee is there any reason that would not be allowed that you know of I mean I don't know the answer that I know of yeah. I, wouldn't want to get I truly don't know the answer that's not a right. yeah. Okay. All right, thank you. Uh, now Representative Kelly. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I, I'm just trying to make sure I understand just the current lay of the land and where we're at, just in general right now. So if I had one of these loans and I went to make a payment today, right. is the only option for me to walk in with cash or check right now? So I could pay today electronically yes. and the lender would accept that payment because the lender wants to get paid. Right. But the, but the, the, at that part, the lender would feel like they're being shortchanged because there's a processing fee to accept the electronic fee. Like a, like a, like sometimes gas stations say $5 minimum, right? So that's that's really where we're, where we're at here right now. They're taking the electronic payments because they want to get the money in hand, but they're not. They feel like they're losing a little bit of money versus when someone pays them cash or check. And, and that's that's a good explanation. A lot of times it'll say wherever and five dollars before you can use a credit card because there is a fee for that credit card. A lot of the gas stations when I was researching this, they said they give you a credit price. They give you a discount for paying cash just because they would prefer cash. They give you the choice in merchants. Okay, thank you for clearing that up a little bit. So they could take electronic payment today? Yes. Okay. They can. It's just a cost factor. When you're, when you're projecting pretty much what your profit is going to be and what your risk is, now more and more are taking and paying with the choice. If, if I'm going to pay, I use a credit card for everything, and I pay it off every month. But if the terms were for me, I would pay cash and save that money. That's just the way I would do business. But then again, we, we establish certain guidelines, and then all we're trying to do is just have it to where the person up front knows if they pay with this method that we can recoup that cost. That's the only thing basically we're trying to do. Would you ever anticipate there coming a time where the lender would, would then, knowing that they're going to get to recoup their convenience fee, only one electronic payment? Because it's, it is easier to process and handle and, and all of that, I would think. You get your money quicker and at that point stop, you know, say, you know, then putting into a contract that the way you pay for this is through electronic measures. I would think that would be the smartest way to do it. I couldn't answer and say that they would, but I would probably say that would be the smartest goal, the easiest way to receive a payment. Okay, thank you. Is that Representative Dickey or Representative Harden down there? You gonna wave? You did? Okay. All right, is there anyone else? Any more questions for Representative Dunhoo? Anything else you want to say? Thank you for your time. Appreciate it. Any questions after here, please come up and I will research it, make sure I get you an answer. And uh, from, from any time. Well, Representative Coomer, I think he mashed his button. I'll recognize him if, if you have something else. Yeah, just one last thing, and then we, we can follow up afterwards. But I understood coming into the meeting today that the practice you're seeking to allow in this bill is currently illegal it is currently prohibited by law so if we, if i can get a definitive answer to whether it is legal or illegal today 
that'll help me in figuring out how we need to, you know, how I need to go forward on the bill. I see somebody waving their hand back there, Mr. Chairman. I don't know if you want to. You want to just come up and you can, yeah. And then tell, tell everybody who you are, let nobody yeah, knows, but. Why, yeah. So the body that regulates this industry, the insurance commissioner's office, has has issued some opinion that 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 practice would be illegal under current law, and you're seeking clarity that would make it legal for you to do this, if your if your member uh, or institutions decided to charge that and put it in the contract and show what the fee is. Thank you. That that's that helps me a lot. Thanks. Okay, anybody else? Okay. Thank you, sir. And with that, our meeting's adjourned.